Newtonian mechanics was reformulated by Lagrange, whose work was further refined by William Rowan Hamilton. Intended to just simplify the equations of motion, this Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics led to unexpected developments that paved the way for statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics. In a previous video, I presented the Lagrangian formulation of classical mechanics with its action principle and corresponding equation of motion. In summary, the main object, called the Lagrangian, is defined as the difference between kinetic and potential energy of the system. The time integral of this object represents the action, which is stationary when the equation of motion, called the Euler-Lagrange equation, is satisfied. Defining the canonical momentum in this way, the Euler-Lagrange equation takes this more compact form. This canonical momentum coincides with the linear momentum for systems of mechanical particles, but they are not necessarily the same. It is important to notice that the Lagrangian depends on Q and Q dot. In the end, the evolution of each degree of freedom of the system is determined by this single second-order equation for Q. Hamilton saw this and wondered if the whole formalism could be refined so that instead of one second-order equation, the evolution of the system could be characterized by two first-order equations. This would double the number of equations to solve, but also make the equations significantly simpler. Hamilton succeeded at this, and, as a bonus, he paved the way for the development of modern physics. Textbooks usually tell the story of how Hamilton replaced the Lagrangian dependent on the coordinates q and its speeds q dot by a new object, now called the Hamiltonian, that instead depends on q and the canonical momentum p. The way to construct this Hamiltonian is via a method called the Legendre transform. From here, Hamilton derived equations for the time evolution of his two canonical variables and found that in general, the Hamiltonian can be written in this form. This is the Legendre transform of the Lagrangian. If you are new to this channel, welcome, great to have you here. If you are not new, you know by now that more than the final answer, I am interested in how these new concepts were originally found. I carefully read Hamilton's paper and found no mention of the Legendre transform. In the end, he effectively found the Hamiltonian to be given by what we call a Legendre transform of the Lagrangian, but he followed a different path, which I will show you in this video. This is Adrien Marie Legendre, distinguished French mathematician that, in 1787, published this paper, introducing a novel change of variables to solve partial differential equations. His work was completely unrelated to mechanics. In fact, he introduced his idea as a trick to solve a particular equation proposed by Lagrange about surfaces in geometry. The equation had already been solved using unfamiliar and tedious methods, and as Legendre writes, I was curious to seek the same solution by ordinary means. I succeeded, quite simply, through a change of variables. Using the proposed transformation, Legendre found that the second-order differential equation that he was studying reduces to an equation of the first order instead. Here is the transformation that he described as a change of variables which might be useful in other occasions. I really like Legendre's humble choice of words here. His transformation indeed became very useful in Hamiltonian mechanics and also in thermodynamics where the Legendre transformation is used to define the so-called thermodynamic potentials. But apparently, Hamilton didn't know about this. Let me now show you the gory details of Hamilton's work. To understand Hamilton's starting point, let's start by writing the kinetic energy, in general, as a function of the coordinates q and its speeds q dot. 
the differential of k is given by the sum of these two terms. This is Hamilton's paper, which he published in 1835 as the follow-up of his previous groundbreaking work establishing what we now call Hamilton's principle of a stationary action, presented in detail in a previous video. Reading these old but seminal physics papers is a lot of fun, but also challenging because the notation is clunky, sometimes mathematical ideas are presented in words instead of equations, and conventions are not as we use them today. Here is a clear example. Instead of potential energy, Hamilton refers to a force function u, which is the negative of our modern potential energy. Here you can probably recognize the Euler-Lagrange equation. And here, Hamilton writes that the living force T, which is today's kinetic energy, is a homogeneous function of the second dimension with respect to eta prime. In equations, he is stating that the kinetic energy is proportional to q dot squared. Now let's take the derivative of this. Solving for q dot and plugging it in the previous equation, we notice that the kinetic energy can be written in terms of its own derivative. Mathematicians will immediately recognize this expression as a particular case of Euler's homogeneous function theorem. This is what Hamilton was referring to in this line. The differential of this expression becomes this sum of terms. Taking the difference of these two expressions, we get the following. Now we introduce the definition of canonical momentum P that Hamilton calls omega in terms of the kinetic energy, assuming that the potential is independent from Q dot. Note that in general, P is a function of Q dot. Hamilton's method is to invert this relation and write q dot as a function of p instead, and then replace every q dot by this function of p. By doing this, the kinetic energy becomes a function of q and p. I denote this by k tilde. Hamilton calls it f. Applying this procedure to the expression on the top left, we get the following. This expression allows determining how k tilde changes under independent changes of p and q. Focusing on the first equation, since Hamilton assumes that the potential energy only depends on q, we can add the term du to dp, which is zero, so that we can write the equation of motion for the variable q in terms of the sum of kinetic and potential energy. Now let's find an equation for P. Here we impose the Euler-Lagrange equation written in this form. Expanding the Lagrangian as kinetic minus potential energy, we get this. Now we use the result above to replace dk to dq by minus dk tilde to dq. And once again, we get the sum of kinetic and potential energy. Here Hamilton finally introduces the function h to denote the sum of kinetic and potential energy written in terms of q and p. With this, the equation of motion for the canonical momentum becomes this. Using this definition for h, we can also update the equation for q. Comparing the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formalisms, we see how the Lagrangian is k minus u in terms of q and q dot, whereas the Hamiltonian is k plus u in terms of q and p. The Euler-Lagrange equation gets replaced by the canonical equations in terms of the Hamiltonian. One important component of the formalism is missing, the Hamiltonian action. For this, we need a direct relation between the Lagrangian L and the Hamiltonian H. Replacing q dot as a function of the canonical momentum p in the Lagrangian, we get what I call L tilde. Adding this and the definition of Hamiltonian found before, the potential energy cancels out and we get this expression. Here I bring back this relation found earlier and use that this derivative is the definition of the canonical momentum p.
From here, we can finally write the Hamiltonian in terms of the Lagrangian. This expression is exactly the Legendre transform of the Lagrangian mentioned at the beginning. Now that we can relate the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian, the action can be extended to depend on Q and P in this form. Hamilton writes the action in a slightly different way, but it is not hard to confirm that this term is just our Q dot. The principle of a stationary action now requires the action to be stationary under infinitesimal variations of both Q and P, which at leading order takes this long form using a Taylor expansion. Now we use the old trick of the derivative of a product to replace Q delta Q dot by these two terms. Grouping common factors and using the fundamental theorem of calculus to take the total derivative out of the integral, we get this. In this term out of the integral, we get the factor delta Q evaluated at the endpoints, which you might remember from the video on Lagrangian mechanics is identically zero. So this last term vanishes. We are left with this expression for the variation of the action, which we make stationary by setting all this to zero. Just like the derivation of the Euler-Lagrange equation, here we use that the variations delta p and delta q are arbitrary. Therefore, the only way for all this integral to vanish is that the two parentheses are simultaneously zero. And from here, we obtain the so-called Hamilton's canonical equations. In his paper, Hamilton does not use indices, so he explicitly writes these two equations for each degree of freedom in the system and refers to them as the differential equations of motion of a system of n points attracting or repelling one another. These equations should not be a surprise to us. These are exactly the equations for the time evolution of Q and P found earlier, but this result confirms the self-consistency of Hamilton's formalism and that his equations of motion are indeed obtained from the action principle. This is the formalism of Hamiltonian mechanics. Instead of a single second-order differential equation per degree of freedom, we now have two equations but of the first order, which simplifies the task of solving them. Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics are the language of physics research. Every theoretical physicist must become proficient in these subjects if they intend to do professional research. Here I only gave you a superficial overview to get you curious about these fields. Interestingly, as I show you in my video decoding Heisenberg's paper creating quantum mechanics, Werner Heisenberg's theory was Newtonian. The final step to formalize quantum mechanics was to take the groundbreaking ideas in Heisenberg's paper and write them in the language of analytical mechanics. This is what Max Born and Pascual Jordan did in the autumn of 1925. Lagrange proudly replaced the three-dimensional vectors of Newtonian mechanics with pure algebra but the Hamiltonian formalism led to an unexpected development that Hamilton could not have imagined. It brought back geometry into mechanics. The Hamiltonian formalism revealed that mechanical systems possess an underlying geometric structure, but not in our three-dimensional space. Instead, the physical state of a system becomes a point in the so-called phase space which is a beautifully abstract concept and one of the most fundamental descriptions of classical mechanics. The canonical variables unfold in a multidimensional space, evolving according to Hamilton's equations. So Hamilton's equations are the basic equations of classical mechanics. They tell you how classical mechanical systems, they are the predictive equations for how particles move or how anything changes with time. Obviously, they have had an enormous impact in physics, and the impact covers every area of physics, every area.
They're there in quantum mechanics, they're there in classical mechanics, they're there in quantum field theory, they're everywheres. Okay, what was the next one?